So I have been promising a ButterFS video for a very long time. And it has been one of those videos where I've kind of just pushed it down the road because it was a very difficult video to make. But it is time for me to sit down and actually make a ButterFS video. Now, it's not going to be what I promised it to be way back when. This is not a tutorial, and I'll explain why it's not a tutorial later on in the video. But needless to say, if you are looking for a tutorial, I'll leave links in the video description to a few tutorials that you can follow for various distributions. So uh, if you want a tutorial, you can head, head on down there and uh, just bypass everything that I'm about to say in this video. But what I want to do today is talk about what ButterFS is. I want to talk about why it's good, why it's bad, why you should use it. I'll talk about some of the tools that you can use to manage it. And along the way, I'll sprinkle in some of my opinion on why I think that it's so good. So before we jump in, if you'd leave a thumbs up on this video, I'd really appreciate it. It really does help the channel. So thank you so very much for doing that. So what is ButterFS? And actually, before we talk about that, let's talk about the name. ButterFS is not actually the name. B3FS is the name, or we hear people call it just BTRFS. Uh, I'm going to call it ButterFS because other people call it ButterFS, and it just rolls off the tongue a little bit better. Why it's called ButterFS or why it got that nickname, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. I didn't create it, so don't come into my comment sections telling me that it's not called ButterFS. I know that. It just is one of the nicknames that it has. So we're going to just move on away from that and all acknowledge that it is a bad, bad name. But uh, Linux and open source developers are not known for being able to name things well. So are we all that surprised? No, we are not. So let's move on. So what actually is ButterFS? At its basis, at the like the top level definition of what it is, it's a file system similar to ext4, ext3, ntfs, fat32, zfs, xfs. There's a ton of file systems out there. ButterFS is one of them. However, it's not just a file system. It does have some features that kind of make it better than most of the rest of them, at least in my opinion. So the primary benefit ButterFS gives you is snapshots. And we'll talk about what a snapshot is here just in a minute. But let's dive deeper into what ButterFS actually is. And to explain that, I have to explain what a copy on write file system actually is. So ButterFS is a copy on write file system. And what I'm about to explain to you is probably going to sound like utter nonsense. I'm going to try to do my best to explain this and just keep in mind that I've tried to record this video now approximately five times. I've explained this in five different ways and none of them have actually been coherent enough for me to actually publish. So we're going to, we're going to hope that this time is the charm. So a copy on write file system basically means that when you modify a, piece of data on your drive, instead of overwriting the previous version of that data, it creates a copy. That's the simplest way that I've discovered to say it. Now, if you were anything like me, you're probably thinking, Matt, why do I want this? Doesn't this just fill my hard drive up with needless copies of old data? Well, yes, it does. And also, no, it doesn't. Basically, what happens once you've made a copy of the new data is the metadata that used to point to the old version is now pointed to the new version. And without the metadata pointing to that old version of the data, the drive and the system can overwrite that data somewhere along the line with something new. So yes, that data technically does still exist until it's overwritten. Now there are, and there's a big situation where that old data is kept, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, but the idea here is that the copy version, which is the new modified version of the data, is where the metadata is stored, and that's the data that you'll interact with going forward. The old version of the data just kind of stays there until it's overwritten. So that's basically what copy and write means, and you have to be wondering, why is that good? What, what benefit does this way of handling data actually give me? And the answer to that question is a thing that we mentioned earlier, snapshots. Snapshots is the premier feature of ButterFS. There are other features as well, but by far the one, at least the user facing feature that I care about the most, and the reason why I think ButterFS is so good is snapshots. Now, what is a snapshot? A snapshot, basically, if you keep in mind what copy and write means, basically a snapshot is a 
set of metadata that points to the old version of the data. So let's just say, for example, and this is a very simplified explanation, you have a text file and you've opened up that text file in Vim, of course, and you've made some modifications. You've added some, some code or whatever, and you save it, colon W. That's how you save in Vim, in case you didn't know. <laughs> you, you save that data, and on a copy and write file system like ButterFS, instead of overwriting the older version of that data, it's created a new copy, and it's moved the metadata from pointing to the old, from the old version to the new version. So, you have that situation in hand, but the old data is actually still there. What a snapshot does, and what it allows you to do, is basically create metadata that points to that old copy of that text file. So that if you were to make a mistake in that new copy, you could roll back to the old copy. Now, obviously, that's a very simplified explanation of what a snapshot is. And to be honest with you, it's not the best example that I could use. Let's use a different one with a more realistic example. So let's just say you're using OpenSUSE. I highly recommend that you actually do use OpenSUSE if you, if you don't you know, mind me moving around the microphone and making some noise in your headphones. OpenSUSE is a fantastic distribution. You should definitely try it. See my previous video. The point here is, is that OpenSUSE uses ButterFS by default. It has a tool called Snapper that runs every time you do an update. Snapper, and we'll talk a little bit more about Snapper later, basically just makes a snapshot every time you do an update before and after. It does it automatically, right out of the box. And the reason why it does that is, let's just say you download a whole bunch of updates and it borks your system. Well, because Snapper has taken a snapshot of that previous state of your system, basically your entire root directory, it's taken a snapshot of that. You can then boot into that old root directory and with one line while you're booted into that read-only snapshot, you can roll back to it. So your computer is no longer broken. So if you think about that for a minute, you're probably thinking, wow, that's a wonderful way to back up your data. Don't think that because snapshots are not backups. And I know I'm pointing at you because I want you to write this on your forehead. Snapshots are not backups. That's the number one misconception that people have of ButterFS snapshots and it's wrong, okay? Out of the box, snapshots are not backups. What snapshots are, are basically small portions of metadata that point to previous copies of your root file system. So when a newer copy of your root file system is corrupted or can't boot or there's something wrong with it, you can go back to the old version because we know that that's there and you can then reset your system to point to that version of your root file system basically allowing you to continue on using your computer when the updates have borked it in, in, in typical Linux fashion, right? So that is enabled, if you remember back when we are talking about copy and write, because the copy is created and the old version is kept. Now in normal times, like I said back then, that older version of the data is just kind of kept there. There's no metadata associated with it. With a snapshot, there is metadata associated with it, therefore that data is kept. If data has metadata associated with it, it's kept on your drive. If there's no metadata associated with it, it can be overwritten. So the reason why I said that is because snapshotting allows you to keep multiple versions of your root file system on your drive at any one time. So if you could for example, if you wanted to, and this is something that most people do when they use ButterFS, is create a baseline working version of their system and then immediately create a snapshot. So let's just say you installed Debian and you decided to set it up with ButterFS and you're going to use TimeShift or you're going to use Snapper, one of those two tools in order to create your snapshots and manage your snapshots, uh, which I recommend that you do you can create a snapshot of your Debian system right there at the beginning and then go forth and experiment and explore and install and corrupt all your system all you want. And you can create many different snapshots after that every time you do an update or install a program or whatever. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could go all the way back to that beginning system previous to installing all those applications or whatever and 
you could go right back to that beginning system and carry on from them there and start all over again if you want to. Now, your user data would still be there because it's not a backup. It's just a snapshot, which is why they call it that, of that previous root file system that you can then boot into and roll back to. So I hope that I've done a fairly good job of explaining what a ButterFS actually is and what snapshots are. I will reiterate that snapshots are not backups. You, if you're going to treat them as backups, you're going to end up as a sad, sad little person because you're going to lose data and you'll just be very, very upset about that. And then you're going to come back to me and tell me, Matt, I've been using ButterFS, but I lost all of my pictures and my the pictures of my children and all this that's all gone. Why didn't you tell me that snapshots aren't backups? I did tell you that. I told you multiple times, don't blame me when it happens. So you still have to do backups, okay? Now, there is a scenario where you can use ButterFS to back up your system, but you have to do that explicitly, and it's not a great way to back up your system. It's just not, okay? It works very, very well for the root file system. It works very, very well for small pieces of data. And the reason why that's the case is because it works really well with and really fast with those pieces of data, right? And you want it to be things that your system depends on, not just random pictures of whatever or d documents or, or whatever, right? Now, you can do that. Like if you have a, a documents folder, you could create a subvolume for your documents and create snapshots of those. That's a reasonable thing to do, but don't rely on it as your sole backup system because at its base, again, you can say it with me, snapshots are not backups. So, just to get that warning out there. Snapshots are by far the premier feature of ButterFS, as I've been saying. And the reason why they're good, and just to go back to our example, is that if you were to do an update where your something in your root file system or an application that you installed or some update or whatever, you know, let's just say you do, let's just say, for example, we'll let's give you another example. For whatever reason, you decided it was a fantastic idea to delete your Etsy file. Let's just say you decided that was a good idea. Let's just see what would happen. You know, well, obviously your system would no longer boot. That's what would happen. If you had a snapshot of your system prior to you being a moron, sorry, uh, you could roll back to your system with an Etsy file already there because that snapshot included the file before you deleted it. And you could just roll back to it and you could carry on and uh, pretend that it never happened, which I highly suggest that you actually do. If you deleted your ex your Etsy file, you should definitely pretend that you never actually did that. And uh, definitely never tell anybody that you did it uh, unless you did it like on purpose just for fun or somebody dared you or whatever. You do you, is, is what they say. Anyways, that's another example of why snapshots are good. So, that all explains why you should use ButterFS. ButterFS if it's set up properly, is a tool that you can use to, to enable snapshotting of your system so that if something were to go wrong, you could roll back to a working version of your system. ButterFS is one of the things that enables things like immutable distros. Now, not all immutable distros use ButterFS, but quite a few of them do. And ba the basic idea of a, an immutable system is that if something goes wrong, you can roll back. ButterFS is one of the things that enables them to do that, right? So, the primary reason to use ButterFS is because of snapshotting. Now, all of that stuff sounded very technical, but also very positive for the most part, right? Why wouldn't everybody use this if it's so awesome and you you should you can just do whatever you want, like delete your Etsy file and then roll back and pretend it never happened? Why doesn't everybody do this? It's basically t a time machine to a working version of your system. Why do doesn't every distribution use it? Well. There are some reasons why you shouldn't use ButterFS, and we're going to talk about those. So first off, as you can tell in the, throughout the whole content of this video, ButterFS is a complicated file system. Okay. Now, the reason why I say that isn't because normal people can't use it, but mostly because it's not a set up and forget kind of thing, right? Whereas if you install, you know, Arch Linux with ext4 as your file system, you just use it, right? You don't have to deal with anything file system related probably ever, right? You just use it. It doesn't have any special features. It just stores your data. It's very, very stable. 
and you go about doing your normal Arch-based Linux things, right? ButterFS isn't like that. Yes, there are distributions that come with ButterFS out of the box. Yes, there are distributions that come with ButterFS set up properly out of the box. I'm looking at OpenSUSE as the primary example of that, but there are, are a few others. But for the most part, if you want to actually take advantage of the tools that ButterFS enables, primarily snapshots, you need to be able to first know that those things are enabled uh, if they're enabled out of the box. Also, you need to know how to use them and create them and roll back to a certain version of your system. You need to know how to, how to do all that, and it can be complicated. It's not a just... Oh my goodness, I, I, I made a mistake and I can roll back with a single command. And technically it is a single command, but you have to have actually done the work in, t in order to enable that single command to work. So just for example, let's talk about Snapper. Snapper is a tool that allows you to take snapshots every time you do an update or even if every time you install a program, right? That's basically what Snapper is. It's a it's a tool. It also comes with several sub tools or it has several sub packages that you can install that will create entries inside of your boot menu. Now, most people use Grub as their boot menu. Some people use System Dboot. Whatever boot menu you use, you can, with certain tools that come along with Snapper, create entries inside of that boot menu that will basically allow you to boot into previous versions of your system previous versions of your root file system, I should say. So if you wanted to go back before you did an update, Snapper will have created that snapshot, and with the certain tools you can use, you can actually boot into that snapshot, which will be read-only, and then you can use one single command to roll back to that file system. So you know it's working because you're there using it, but you need to do that extra command in order to roll back. But if you didn't do any of that setup work, if you didn't install Snapper, if you didn't get it set up properly, if you didn't install all the packages that create the, the boot menu entries, if you didn't do any of that stuff, you can be using ButterFS and have none of the benefits of ButterFS. That's one of the reasons why this is not a tutorial, okay? Because <laughs> not only do you have to do all those extra steps in order to get ButterFS to function at its full potential, but it's different on every single distribution. So Fedora does ButterFS differently than OpenSUSE does. They both use ButterFS out of the box. They both create snapshots every time you do an update, but they do them differently. They both create subvolumes, which is basically, uh, and I'm going to get chewed out for explaining subvolumes like this, but they're basically partitions. They're not exactly the same. They're, they're mountable points on your system associated with ButterFS chunks. That's basically the way that they explain it. Uh, you don't really need to know in, in this situation what a subvolume is because it's not a tutorial. But just the point is, is that both OpenSUSE and Fedora do subvolumes differently. They handle their snapshots differently. And those are the two primary distributions that use ButterFS out of the box. Those are the, those are the two like shining examples I have of ButterFS usage. Uh, the only other one that really does it really, really well is Arco Linux. Arco Linux, if you choose ButterFS out of the box, will actually set up Snapper for you. It will set up the boot menu for you so you can boot into previous versions of your operating system and all that stuff. Those are the only three true examples of out-of-the-box usage of ButterFS. Every other distribution, you are required to do it manually. So, for example, on Debian, yes, you can, in the Debian installer, choose ButterFS as your file system. But if you don't take the extra steps to do it properly, it's going to do, do you absolutely no good. So you actually have to get out during the install process, if you want to do it properly on ButterFS or for ButterFS, you have to get out of the installer, go into the TTY, you have to unmount the current mount points for where the ISO is pointing. You have to create new mount points. You have to create the sub volumes that you need to create in order for things to work. So you need to create your home sub volume. You need to create your uh, roots sub volume and all this stuff. You need to edit the Etsy, the Etsy uh, slash FS tab file in order to actually have those things mounted upon boot once everything's done. It's a process, right? And I just vaguely described that process. And that's just the Debian way of doing it. Doing it on Ubuntu is slightly different. Doing it on a Arch-based distribution would be slightly different. And so you guys get the idea why this is not a tutorial. Every single distribution does it a little bit differently. And that's also another reason why you shouldn't use ButterFS. Now, I'm not saying that but ButterFS isn't good. And I personally say everybody should use it. But 
you have to know going in that it is very distro dependent on how it works, how it's set up. Sometimes it's a fully manual process, meaning that everything that you need to do in order to get it to work is reliant on you doing that work. Some distros like OpenSUSE do it for you. Some distros like Fedora do it for you, but do it in a different way. Some, you know, you get the idea, right? So that's pr the probably the primary reason why ButterFS isn't for everyone. But there are a couple other ones, and it it is very important for me to say this. ButterFS is listed as unstable. Now, if I had said that at the beginning of the video, nobody would have watched. That's absolutely the truth because nobody wants a file system that is unstable. In fact, a unstable file system is like having an engine in a car that doesn't work half the time, right? <laughs> you don't get to go from point A to point B unless your engine works. Probably. I mean, unless you're going to push it, <laughs> you know? So an unstable file system is not a good thing. But, and this is a big but, I've been using ButterFS now for two years maybe even longer, probably longer, and I've never had a single time where ButterFS hasn't been stable. I've talked to many different people who use ButterFS, and every single one of them, bar a couple of exceptions, have had the exact same experience that I've had, that it's a very, very stable file system for you to use. You can rely on it. It's not like it's going to crash and start eating your data, none of that stuff. As far as I can tell, it is a very stable file system. But it is listed as unstable, and they do that for a reason, because it's still in development. It has been around for a very long time, but they're still developing it. You still get updates to it quite often, and there, with that situation going on such as it is, it means that things can go wrong. So if you were to use ButterFS, and like I said, I would say give it a try, you definitely want to make sure that you have actual back backups. Not snapshots, but actual like firm pieces of data on an external hard drive that you can grab should your file system blow up in your face, okay? So that's the big one. I probably should have led with it at the beginning, but like I said, I wanted people actually to watch this video. So ButterFS is listed as, as unstable, just you should definitely know that. The other thing that bothers a lot of people about ButterFS is the way that it stores old data after it's copied new data. Now. That sentence doesn't probably really make sense to a lot of people, but remember, we talked about copy and write. It has a whole bunch of old data once it's made that those copies. And when new stuff is written to the subvolumes or to the disk, it's overwritten on top of that data that doesn't have metadata associated with it. And because, and, and this is very not technical, so I, I don't want to get into the technical details of why this is. Sometimes when you have a piece of data, it's, you know, this big, and then the new piece of data is this big, and because the new piece of data is overwritten over top of the old data, there's still a piece of the old data that's there that is just kind of left there as a fragment, right? Now, if you remember back in the old days, back in the Windows days, when you're using Windows, you're, if, if you were a long-time computer user, you probably remember having to defragment your hard drives. This is kind of the same thing. Now, you don't have to defragment it because that's, you know, it's a it's SSD. It's going to work out fine in the end. But a lot of people don't care for the fact that there's these fragments of data being left on their disk, right? And it can cause some issues regarding stability as the operating system, or as the file system, I should say, actually progresses in ages, right? So the more fragments you have, the more really weird the data can get and sometimes it slows things down sometimes it causes errors so that is an issue now i think that they're working on it i don't know if that's something that they can solve or whatever i don't know the technical details but it's definitely something that you should keep in mind as as you go along so those are the two primary reasons why you shouldn't use butterfs now all that being said i i, I know those are big ones right uh, you know the instability the complicated nature of it the the fragmentation stuff, all that stuff. Those, those three reasons are big, big reasons why you shouldn't use ButterFS. But it is so astonishingly good. It is so astonishingly good to have those snapshots. If especially Now, it's not as useful on, say, like Debian or Ubuntu. You can use them, and it can be helpful in some situations, but the, the primary reason of ButterFS is those snapshots, and you don't get a lot of updates on Debian or Ubuntu doesn't mean you don't get them. It doesn't mean that snapshots can't be useful. 
but they really shine. I mean, they really truly shine on a rolling release. So if you're on Arch, or if you're on OpenSUSE, or even Fedora, even even though it's not technically a rolling release, you know, anywhere where you get a lot of updates and you have the potential for those updates to cause you issues, a snapshot that can save your ass when those updates do cause you issues is priceless. I can't even tell you that the, it, basically what it does is it gives you a sense of, it's basically insurance. It's like house insurance or car insurance. You don't want to have to use it, but you pay for it anyways because if you do go out and crash your car into a tree or run over a squirrel that causes you to, to do whatever, you know, you, you cause some major issues to your car, you want to have that insurance so that you can get your car repaired. That's basically what a snapshot is. It enables you to have that peace of mind. If something were to go wrong with your root file system where it no longer works, you can go back to a snapshot that does work and continue on with your day. That's what snapshots are good for. It just gives you that peace of mind so that you can use your computer knowing that if something does go wrong, you can continue to use it without having to actually fix the problem. So that's ButterFS. Now, I talked about why it's not a tutorial in this video, but I also want to talk just briefly about some of the tools that go along with it. So I talked about Snapper. Snapper enables you to create snapshots during updates or installation of programs. It is a fairly complicated tool to set up. So I, if you're going to want to try it out without having to go through that pain, I would suggest using either OpenSUSE Tumbleweed in order to do it. I'm not sure how how Leap does it, but I know Tumbleweed does it right out of the box. I'm assuming that they're the same, but I don't know. Uh, or Arco Linux. Arco Linux, if you choose ButterFS from the drop-down during Calamari's, also sets up Snapper for you, or at least it did, and it allow, that will allow you to use it and experience the awesomeness that is Snapper. There are tutorials on YouTube, and I'll link to a couple of them on how to set up Snapper on other distributions, so you can check those out. The other tool that I should mention is TimeShift. Now, TimeShift has been around for a very long time. For for most of its life, it was an rsync front end. So basically, it was a backup tool, right? It now has the ability to use ButterFS, and it allows you to create snapshots just like Snapper does, only with a GUI, right? And it also has the ability to tie in with your boot menu, so you can boot into those snapshots if you need to. Uh, it requires extra packages in order to do so. It requires extra setup in order to do so. So just like Snapper, it can be complicated. So those are the two tools that if you're going to get into this or if you're going to jump into this rabbit hole, you should definitely keep in mind and should look into. Now, so there are a couple things that I want to talk about last, and that is that I'm planning on some videos to kind of follow this up. First, I do want to do a tutorial on how to do this, specifically on Arch Linux. So Arch is a very major distribution. I think that ButterFS is probably the most useful on a rolling release like Arch. And because it doesn't happen out of the box, I would like to do a tutorial on how to do that. So if you're interested in seeing that, leave a comment in the comment section below. Leave a thumbs up so that I know that you want to do that. Uh, another th video that I want to make is talk specifically about Snapper. Uh, and I will basically set up Snapper on a distribution and we'll talk about actually creating snapshots in that video. So those are two videos that you can look forward to. Make sure you're subscribed. When those will happen, I don't know, but they will happen eventually. So keep an eye out for those. That is it for this video. Now this, like I said, was a very difficult video to make because I wanted to try to make sure I was explaining things the way they needed to be explained. So I hope I did a fairly good job for that. If you're confused, leave a comment in the comment section below. I'll try to explain or at least point you towards documentation that might explain it better than I can. So comments in the comment section below, questions and all that stuff. You can, uh, if you haven't already, leave a like on this video. I'd really appreciate it. It does help the channel. Thanks for following. Thanks everybody for watching. You can follow me on Mastodon or Odyssey. Those links will be in the video description. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash linuxcast. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. You guys are all absolutely amazing. Without you, the channel just would not be anywhere near where it is right now. So thank you so very, very much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. Just seriously, thank you so very much. Thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you next time.